in the field of public administration. He will serve on the accreditation board of the Canadian Association of Program in Public Administration from 2022 to 2024. Dr. Roberts writes extensively on problems of governance, law, and public policy. He has published several books and won numerous awards for his work. His most recent book, Strategies for Governing, Reinventing Public Administration for a Dangerous Century, was published by Cornell University Press in 2020. Strategies for Governing has received the 2021 Book Award from Section on Public Administration Research of American Society for Public Administration. In addition to the books, Dr. Roberts publishes his research in scholarly academic journals and has won several awards for his journal articles. Dr. Roberts' list of awards is so long that I have provided a link in the chat to do the justice to his accomplishments. And uh, I, I will provide that link soon. Uh, I look forward to his most recent book project, Super States, Empires of the 21st Century, forthcoming from Polity in late 2022. Dr. Roberts has undertaken several research projects on the issues of the South Asian region. In his recent book, Strategies for Governing, he puts forth the argument that the field of public administration needs to widen its horizon and embrace a more global perspective. He advocates for extending the analysis at the country level, um, at the international level, to capture the global complex dynamics. His views on the global perspective for the field of public administration and policy is what the NASPA South Asia Conference is all about, isn't it? We all are trying to make it more global, uh, interaction with the global um, public administration and policy field. Thus, without further delay, I welcome Dr. Roberts to take the floor and look forward to his talk titled, Can Democracy Work in Supersized Polities? Thank you, Dr. Roberts, for your time and willingness to share your insights with us today. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you uh, all. I hope everyone is having a good morning if you're in that time zone. And uh, it's a pleasure to connect with you at least virtually. Uh, my last trip before the onset of the great pandemic was to uh, India in January, 2020. And I'm very much hoping to get back to the region for my next trip after the pandemic in uh, 2022. Uh, so what I propose to do is just uh, start sharing screen and uh, I've got some PowerPoints and I'll talk for about 30 minutes and then we can just open it up for a conversation. Um, and so in theory, you're looking at my screen right now. Um, uh, could someone give me a thumbs up if you're, if you're seeing the screen? Oh, good, excellent. And, and the slides are moving, okay? Yep, good. Yes. All right. So um, uh, my title is Can Democracy Work in Supersized Polities? But what I'd really like to do is just actually touch uh, on three topics. I'll touch on the first two briefly. Um, uh, the first I want to do, do is talk about the need for improved representation of South Asia uh, in the field of uh, public administration and research in public administration. I uh, want to talk very briefly about the what the aims of the field ought to be, in my view, and then I'll just give you a, a little bit uh, of a presentation of some ideas I'm working on for a uh, in a coming book, a book that will be out next year. So let me just touch briefly on the uh, first question I, I just want to touch on, and that is the need for improved representation of uh, South Asia in the field of public administration. Um, and I want, I think it would be helpful for us to think of the field of public administration, the scholarly field as a, as a system for producing and distributing knowledge. It's a, it's a way we develop understandings about how government works and how it ought to work. And that system consists of uh, professional and scholarly associations includes associations like NASPA, obviously, and various uh, other uh, scholarly associations in the field. Uh, it includes a set of journals uh, in public administration. And obviously, it is, includes a set of conferences like the conference we're doing today, the usual circle of, cycle of conferences that bring academics together. Um, and it is a system by which we generate research and, and understandings about, uh, about our domain, the, the field of public administration. Um, and the point I would want to make is that 
I think we need to recognize that this is a field that has been for many years and is still dominated by a handful, a very small number of very unusual countries. Uh, uh, you know, there are estimated to be about 193 countries in the world. Uh, if, if, and I'll show you the data in a moment. Um, in fact, this is a field that is dominated by say three or four countries, uh, 10 perhaps uh, at the most. And these are unusual companies, uh, countries. They're, they're wealthy, except for the United States, they're relatively small. Uh, and they are politically stable, liberal democracies. Um, and they have a, a research agenda that reflects those underlying realities. Um, and this is also a system, as I say, that does set the research agenda. This is a system that tells us what problems are going to get attention in conferences, in journals, and so on, uh, it, what issues we ought to pay attention to. Um, but I think I would like to make the argument that it is also a system that neglects many problems that are confronting uh, most countries and people uh, in the world. Uh, the reality is that most countries in the world are, are fragile, they're uh, unstable, they have limited governmental capabilities, they suffer severely from problems like corruption and uh, secretiveness, um, and they have limited and contested freedoms for their peoples. And uh, that is the norm uh, when we look at all of the countries in the world. And uh, we ought to have a research agenda in the field of public administration that directly addresses the problems that confront most people living on the planet. That's sort of the basic proposition I'd like to um, advance. Uh, this is just one chart that illustrates the point I'm making. Uh, I pulled it from the fragile, uh, the Fund for Peace, which produces something called the Fragile States uh, Index. Um, the blue and green states uh, on this map are the ones that are considered to be uh, very stable. Uh, you know, these map projections are unfair to the global south. They make Canada look very, very big, but Canada's, a, in terms of population, a very, very small country. Um, but you know, the reality is that the research agenda is driven by a small number of countries in the upper part of North America and the Northwestern part of Europe, uh, the blue and green zones. But most people on this planet uh, are living in um, the parts of the world that are not uh, blue and green. And we ought to have a research agenda that reflects that reality. Um, what I did um, uh, a couple of days ago was I went to Journal Citation Reports, which is the database that tells us, um, uh, well, it, it's the database that's used to, to get data that for the so-called top ranked journals in the world. Ranking journals globally is a dubious exercise, but it is done. And this is the database that's used to do it. Um, I took the uh, all of the articles uh, that had been published in the, uh, the top journals, the top 10 journals over the year 2020, there were about 3000 articles. And I looked at where those articles were coming from, where, where were the people writing those articles actually based. Uh, and you can see here that if you look at just three countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, and the Netherlands, you already get to 50% of all of the articles published in the all of the top 10 journals. Um, and then of course, if you look at the rest of the list, I think I've got uh, 10 countries on that list in total, uh, 10 countries accounting for almost 85% of all articles published in the top 10 journals. And you can see, as I say, they are a pretty unusual group of countries. Aside from the US, very small, uh, uh, stable, liberal, wealthy uh, democracies. Um, you know, most of the countries in this list have a population less than the population of metropolitan Delhi. Uh, now, the uh, countries that aren't represented in the top journals, uh, here I just took a, a list of the 
10 most populous countries in the world. And then I asked uh, how many um, articles, what proportion of articles were coming from those uh, countries. And you can see the proportion of articles coming from those countries is very, very small. Uh, India with 1.4 billion people accounts for one tenth of 1% 1 of articles published in the top 10 journals in public administration. What that means in numbers is that out of 3000 articles published in 2020, four originated from uh, India. And you can see that the results for Pakistan and Bangladesh are uh, equally uh, low. And this is a deeply problematic uh, fact. Um, so the, uh, I can actually give you a couple of more illustrations of the concern I have. Um, this uh, chart in the back of this slide is from a paper that Arun Manoharan at University of Massachusetts, Boston, and I wrote a couple of years ago. What Arun and I did was we took all of the questions asked on the public administration examination set by the Union Public Service Commission uh, for entry into the civil service over the last 10 years. And then we excerpted every theoretician, every academic who was mentioned in any question over the last 10 years. And we made a list of how often they were referenced. And I know the names are gonna be, some of them are obscured and the type is small, but if you look at the right-hand column, that's the interesting fact. Look at the nationality of all of the scholars who were mentioned in that list. Um, they're almost entirely uh, American. Um, and I, can say with a high degree of comfort that the American scholars who are mentioned on this list uh, probably never wrote anything consequential about South Asia in the whole of their careers. Um, and there is something problematic about the fact that students in South Asia, thousands of students every year are compelled to study all of these scholars whose work is not directly relevant to their lived reality. When you look at that set of examinate the public administration exam that's set by the commission there's part one theory part two practice um, and there's a real disconnect between part one and part two the theory is western basically american theory the practice is the realities of indian governance um, and we need to remedy that that uh, disparity um, so what can we do to fix this problem uh, First, I think I'd like to make the proposition that organizations that claim a global role uh, should have global representation. And I mean here academic associations that claim a global role uh, and journals uh, and uh, that claim a global role as well. Um, you know, if there's a national organization, if the Canadian Journal of Public Administration is simply claiming to be a Canadian journal and it's only got Canadians and it's uh, contributor list and its board uh, good enough. But uh, an organization, for example, including NASPA, that has chosen to take on a global role um, should have global representation. Um, and I'm not saying anything here I haven't said in the, in the forum of a NASPA itself. Uh, the the NASPA is run by an executive council that is exclusively composed of representatives of American schools, even though it claims to be a global organization setting global standards for education and public affairs. And it's been doing this for 10 years. And this I think is a situation that needs to be remedied. There are no representatives of South Asia on its executive council, no representatives of Central Asia, Africa, Europe, Latin America, Central America, uh, and I could go on. Um, and so if we want to set a global standard and have a global dialogue, we ought to have appropriate global representation. Um, and if the answer will be, well, you know, the rules don't permit us or our work processes in the case of journals don't permit us to have global representation, then I think the answer is we change the rules and we change the work process processes. Um, if journals are going to claim that they're that scholars in the rest of the world, the global south are unable to meet the usual standards of the journal or the usual procedures set by the journal, then we set, then we look critically at the procedures to ensure that we've got adequate representation. 
in particular, I'd, I'd note that global journals are, they're not nonprofit organizations. They actually make a lot of money, a large amount of money. There ought to be more transparency about what journals do with their money. Um, but they also ought to be spending some of that money to improve global representation. And I think what we can all do, um, if we're not in the US or the UK or Denmark, is basically uh, think critically about the research agenda that is being set by the top ranked journals and ask, are these the questions that really ought to be addressed in our research? And I would also make the argument that policy schools that are emerging in the global south should think critically about what their own curricular needs are. I think you've already heard from Yemeni IR of the Center for Policy Research. Um, the center is uh, running a very interesting uh, project in which it's running a course on, I think it's called Understanding State Capabilities, which is a, uh, an interesting exercise in developing a curriculum that is tailored to um, realities in South Asia. So we don't want to take just off the shelf recommendations about curriculum from uh, the global north. So that's the first point. The second point I wanna make is just uh, what the aims of the field should be. I'll be briefer about this. Um, uh, this is a difficult time for people who advocate for democracy and human rights. Uh, I don't need to belabor this point because it will be familiar to you. There are many uh, studies that assess the condition of democracy and human rights around the world. And all of them say that democracy and human rights is on the back foot, it's on the defensive. And my own view is that the field ought to be forthright about saying what it's about. Uh, we're not just interested in making government work better. We're certainly not interested in making authoritarian governments work better. We're interested in making uh, governments that are committed to democracy and human rights work better. And I think we should say that uh, explicitly. American public administration has been in this situation before. I wrote an article um, back in 2019 about the way that public administration in the United States thought about the uh, demise of democracy and human rights in the 1930s. Um, and the citation for this article is on the top of the slide. Um, the challenge they confronted in the 1930s was the question of, uh, would they continue dealing with Germany as the Nazi regime became consolidated? And the position taken by American public administration uh, specialists at that time was, yes, they would continue dealing with uh, bureaucrats in Nazi Germany. Um, and they did that for several years. And the position they took was, well, we don't do politics. Uh, we just do administration. We're just technicians. We don't get into the higher questions of politics. Uh, and so they continued dealing uh, with, the, uh, with Nazi Germany, even though there were reports of human rights abuses, reports of concentration camps, reports about the uh, the uh, degradation of democratic institutions and so on. That picture I'm showing you in that slide with the Nazi banner in front is actually a, the picture of a conference site uh, for a conference in public administration held in Berlin uh, that American specialists went to in 1936. They walked through the front door of that conference and said to themselves, well, you, we're gonna put up with this because we don't talk politics. In retrospect, this was a low point in the history of American public administration. And I think I would make the argument that we face a similar challenge today in saying forthrightly that we are for democracy and human rights. Um, the basic foundation document is of course the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but there are many other statements of human rights that we might uh, look to. Uh, there is an argument that, well, you know, uh, as long as we're advocating for the sustainable development goals, we're okay. Um, my own view would be that's not a plausible argument. The sustainable de uh, development goals are, are fine so far as they go, but they are not the same as advocating for democracy and human rights. 
If you look at Sustainable Development Goal 16, for example, there are a lot of important things in there that we care about. Uh, Self-determination, free and fair elections, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and so on. And so it's fine to advocate for the Sustainable Development Goals, but what we really want to advocate for explicitly uh, is a commitment to democracy and human rights. Um, I've had the pleasure of co-chairing a uh, working group of deans and directors of schools uh, of public policy over the last year, co-chairing it with Henry Brady of the uh, Goldman School at, the, uh, at uh, UC Berkeley. Uh, and we've come up with a statement that we have signed on to, um, basically saying that as leaders of schools of public service, we are committed to human rights and fundamental democratic freedoms and that we're going to try and pursue those values in our uh, teaching, research, and other engagement activities. So that's the second point I want to make. I'll just now tell you a bit about the project I'm working on, which actually ties to both of the preceding points I was just making. Uh, I'm writing this book called Super States, Empires of the 21st Century. Um, it says it's forthcoming from Polity Books in 2021. It's actually forthcoming in 2022. It should be out uh, a year from now. And I'll tell you a bit about the pretext for this book. Um, over the last uh, 100 years, we've, we've gone through a couple of phases in the sort of evolution of politics. Uh, a century ago, if we were meeting in 1921, not 2021, uh, we would still be saying that we live in the age of empires. That is to say, most people on the planet didn't live in states as we understand them today. They, they lived in one empire uh, or uh, another. Empire was the sort of default way of organizing politics uh, around the world. These were very large enterprises, very diverse uh, enterprises, usually uh, autocratic. Uh, Perhaps they had some sort of civilizing mission, but they really didn't do much for the people that were living within uh, one empire or another. Of course, empires collapsed. We had the process of decolonization after the Second World War, and we entered into the, the so-called age of states. As I mentioned earlier on, there are now 193 states in the world. Uh, I've, I've made the observation now and then that, that most states in the world are actually younger than I am. Um, I suppose you can take that two ways. Either the states are young or I'm very old, but one way or the other, it's a relatively new phenomenon in the long course of history. But states are different than empires. Um, they tend to be smaller. They tend to be more homogeneous. They are very often trying to develop some sense of nationality, common identity. They have to do more than empires used to do. They have to govern their territory more intensively. And they have to make a show, at least, of respecting uh, human rights. Uh, and the argument I want to make is that we're entering into a new phase that's a sort of a, a blend or a hybrid of the previous two phases, that we're moving into an age of what I'm going to call super states a world that's dominated by polities that are, have the scale and diversity of empires, um, but also all of the governance burdens of states. Uh, so uh, just to get right down to it, uh, if you look at what the world will look like by 2050, the most populous country in the world by uh, 2050 will be India with about 1.7 billion people. It will surpass China. I think it's shortly going to surpass China as the most populous country in the world. Then of course, China, European Union will have about 440 million people and the US will have about 400 million people. Uh, and about 40% of the world's population is gonna live in the rest of those places. If you take those four places aside, there are, there are 160 other countries. Um, on average, those countries have a population of about 30 million people and they have roughly the territory of New Zealand. So you have a lot of small countries and a small number of very big countries. 
And I could include, if I expanded that set of very large countries a little bit, countries like Pakistan, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Brazil, Indonesia uh, as well. Uh, now, these are countries that are sort of like empires. They're very big, uh, populous, uh, lots of territory, uh, very diverse populations. Uh, but they're also unlike empires in the sense that they're harder to govern than empires were. Uh, empires didn't have to worry about an educated population. They didn't have to worry about a population with smartphones. They didn't have to worry about a population that could move around in cars or trains or planes. Uh, they didn't have to worry about a population that could organize on the internet. Um, so governing a, su a, a super state, as I'm going to call it, uh, a state that has the expansiveness and diversity of an empire, but all the burdens of being a state, all the burdens of governance in the modern age. Uh, so this is an extraordinarily challenging exercise and it is unprecedented in history. Uh, even if I took away all of the complications I just described and I said, okay, um, imagine the idea of governing a, a, a state that has 1.7 billion people why would it be reasonable to believe that that's a, uh, a plausible proposition? Um, and that, as I say, is basically going to be the question that we confront uh, in this century. Um, I, I've just pulled a, cover, a few covers of recent books about the US, China, uh, Europe, and uh, India. And when you look at all of these titles, Divided We Fall, Fragile Superpower, The End of U Europe, what you get is a common theme. And is it that the common theme is a sense of the fragility of all of these enterprises. Um, and I won't belabor this point, but if you look into the, the literature on each of these uh, four polities, and I should say that one of the interesting things about this literature is it's all stovepiped. You know, there's there's a there's there's a group of American specialists, EU specialists, Chinese specialists, Indian specialists. They don't talk to each other that much, but the argument I would make is that they're actually addressing similar sorts of problems in different language. Um, but fragility, this sense of how do we hold things together or strains or centrifugal forces that are pulling things apart. That's a common element of the dialogue in all of these countries. Um, the proposition I wanna make is that fragility is endemic to super states. You just can't get rid of it. These states, because of their size and complexity are always dealing with multiple threats to their survival. And very often they're dealing with what I will call cascading hazards problems that pile on one after the other, financial crisis and pandemic and migration crises and, and so on. Problems that if they hit at the same time actually uh, uh, compound and create an even worse effect. So uh, that's the, the, the aim of the book. I've, I've mentioned four super states, the, the ghost, that is at the always present in the room is the fifth super state, which is the Soviet Union. That's an empire, the Russian empire that tried to become a super state and failed and collapsed. And leaders in all of these countries are, uh, have had at one point in their mind, uh, at, in time, in the back of their mind, the, the, the question, uh, will we go the way of the Soviet Union? The common question is how you hold things together. Um, and if you look back at the literature on empires, the common answer was always, you need some form of authoritarianism to hold a big supersized polity together. Uh, and I won't bother going through these quotes. I would note the lot, last one from uh, John, Sir John Strachey is, he was a, a colonial administrator in India at the uh, end of the uh, 19th century, articulating the common view that you needed strong central authority to hold everything together. Uh, so there's this, this sense that authoritarianism is essential. 
And if we look around at our four polities, you can see that uh, all of them wrestle with the question of how much democracy you can have in a supersized state. Uh, China, as we know, has repudiated Western style liberal democracy uh, entirely. Uh, uh, India uh, is, a, as, is constitutionally committed to liberal democracy, but there have been moments in its history when the country is under stress, when it has reverted to uh, centralization. Uh, under Nehru, under Gandhi in the 70s, uh, some argue under Modi today, uh, the, India was recently downgraded to, I believe, an electoral autocracy and late, the latest assessments of the state of democracy. Uh, by the VDEM Institute. Uh, the European Union's an interesting exercise. Uh, common complaints about a so-called democratic deficit in Brussels. They have a European parliament, but it is very weak. Of all of these uh, super states, uh, the one that is perhaps most thoroughly democratized at the center is uh, America. Uh, but we've also seen that uh, America is going through a period of dysfunction at the moment, uh, an apparent inability to work away its way through a series of important national problems and even disputes about the integrity of national elections. So this question of how you make democracy work in supersized states is clearly a, a tricky uh, question. Um, so I'm, I elaborate on this in the book, but I, I will just touch very briefly on, on, on some problems uh, that I note in the book. Um, one is a tendency of democratic competition, if it's poorly regulated, to create a pressure uh, to centralize policy responsibilities. That is, if you have a polity that runs national elections, policy itself tends to get nationalized. There is more pressure on central government to do something about problem X or problem Y. And this can compound the problem of overload at the center. Uh, overload is a common, was a common problem in empires and is a common problem, I think, in super states as well at the center. Um, and it also tests the capacity of the of administrative capacity, you know, the, the general question of whether in an extraordinarily large polity, people at the center can actually achieve the effective implementation of policy um, at the bottom of the pyramid. So that's problem one. Problem two is the tendency of democratic competition to uh, politicize policy differences between different sections or parts of the country. You know, one of the reasons that the Europeans are careful about democratization at the center is because they know there are sharp differences between member countries. And one common technique has been to use either diplomacy or technocracy to depoliticize issues. Of course, democratic competition very often has exactly the reverse effect of heating up policy problems. A, a third problem is uh, poorly designed leadership structures combined with democratic competition. So to give you an example, in the US, a leadership structure that has a very powerful president um, and, a, and a system in which the presidency is essentially a winner take all competition. Uh, winning or losing the presidency for one party or another or one region of the country or another is a very, very big deal, is perceived to be a very big deal because the presidency is regarded as a powerful institution. Um, so democracy combined with this sort of winner take all structure, I think aggravates problems of sectional conflict. People care a lot about who wins or who loses in that race. And then the fourth observed difficulty of, of dem democracy in these very large supersized states is, is what I'm going to call the mentality of rule. Uh, and by that, I mean the, 
the way that the leadership group in a polity or a country thinks about the task of governing. Um, in my own country in Canada, uh, for a long time, uh, uh, politics had a reputation for being very dull, being very gray, bland, you know, nothing interesting ever happened in politics. And the political class, I think, liked to keep it that way. Uh, and why was that? And that was because politics consisted largely of negotiating differences between different parts of the country. And there was a real danger if the uh, negotiations between different parts of the country went wrong, that the country would fall apart. And so there was a serious emphasis on negotiation, bargaining, uh, lowering the temperature in the room. Um, and this, I think, goes back probably to the first point that the, the, that style of bargaining, of increment, incrementalism, is not really entirely consistent with the, the mode of thought, the sort of political culture that evolves in a robust democratic system, where it's about campaigning, making bold promises. You know, nobody gets excited about going to the polls to vote for somebody who says they're going to engage in incremental negotiation for the next four years. Um, in the United States, when President Biden, uh, shortly before uh, President Biden took office, there was much discussion about all the great things he was going to do in the first hundred days of, of his uh, 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 government. There was talk about another new deal and so on. And this is not peculiar to President Biden. It happens every time a new president comes in. There's this discussion about all the grand things he will do in his first hundred days. Um, that's a, a relatively new phenomenon in American history. But um, you know this, this idea of making big promises about what you will do in your first hundred days is encouraged by robust democratic competition, uh, but it also intensifies uh, sectional anxieties, tensions between different parts of the country. Because there is this feeling, as I say, that uh, everything rides on who wins the competition. So uh, I, I will wrap up in a moment, but uh, just to give you a brief sense of the things I'm likely to end up saying in the book, um, how do you think about democracy and human rights in a supersized uh, polity? Um, I'm going to throw out a couple of uh, observations. Um, one is I think you try to limit the functions that are allocated to the center. Um, you do that in part to uh, prevent overload at the center and also to simplify the job of what I'm calling sectional accommodation. That's an American phrase, incidentally, it's basically talking about bargaining between different parts of the country. Um, the less there is on the agenda of central government, the less there is to negotiate about between different parts of the country. Uh, but at the same time, and incidentally, this is the formula that the European Union uses, um, limited functions at the center, most functions devolved to lower levels, uh, with the caveat that the center does have this role of being the umpire with regard to democracy and human rights for the lower tier of government. So in the EU, the formula is uh, limited democratization at the center, robust democratization at the lower tier of government. Um, and I think we can also say that one of the things we would attend to in a very large polity is making sure that we have structured central, central institutions to make sure that they are recognizing that a large chunk of what they do is negotiating between uh, uh, different parts of the country, diff different sections of the population, avoiding winner-take-all institutions, uh, creating forums for representation of major sections, creating forums for the negotiation of differences. And then I think my th next point would be, you know, every one of these polities has a creed. It has a story it tells about why the polity has to exist or the mission it has to serve. 
Um, back in the age of empires, we would talk about the civilizing mission of empire. Um, polities have civilized, super states have civilizing missions as well, but they have to be carefully crafted. Um, we don't want to necessarily uh, be dogmatic about the notion that there is a national culture uh, or even that there is a nation uh, or a people as opposed to many peoples. Uh, it has to be a trick of acknowledging diversity in the, in the, uh, in the idea of the super state. Um, and then finally, I think the observation would have to be that we need to cultivate a mentality that recognizes that fragility is endemic to supersized states. What do I mean by that? A recognition among political leaders, but also the population at large, that uh, uh, fragility is the norm. It's never going to go away. There is a notion in thinking about governance today that, well, you know, crisis is uh, something that happens now and then, that crisis is abnormal. Um, in supersized states, crises happen all the time. If you look at the story, history of the European Union over the last 20 years, it's, it's been one crisis after another. Um, someone described the European Union as essentially a system of crisis management. And I think I would argue that the governance structures of all super states are essentially systems of crisis management. You have to have a mentality that recognizes that frig fragility is endemic and a leadership class and also a civic culture that recognizes um, the constant need to be attentive to hazards and on your toes in responding to hazards. So I will um, just stop there except to make this uh, final point. Um, as I said at the start, I think we're engaged in this century in a, in a great experiment. We've got polities that are bigger than anything we've ever seen in human history. Uh, the story about empires, whenever you look at the vast and growing literature on empires, is that empires always died. And um, the question is whether superstates are going to suffer the same fate. Uh, can they be kept intact? Can they thrive? Can they be kept intact while respecting democracy and human rights? And so uh, with that, I will stop uh, sharing the screen and I'd be happy to discuss anything you'd like to discuss. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. Uh, great, great insightful presentation as always. Uh, and uh, I would like to open the floor for any questions. Uh, we can uh, raise hands in Zoom. And also, if you'd like to type your question to everyone in the chat, you are welcome to do so. And we will go uh, one question at a time. Any questions? Okay. We do have a question there, yeah. and Nandita. Yeah, can I oh, start? Chipona? Yes, Taufik, you can go ahead, and then Nandita, you you will be oh, next. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Roberts, for a very very fascinating uh, presentation, and also with some real facts and figures about this research agenda and publication, the, the top ten most journals. I'm sure that would be an eye opening for many of the South Asian uh, researchers and the young scholars who are trying to publish and they are feeling real difficulties. I'm very happy that you uh, mentioned those issues, uh, especially the uh, <clears throat> structure of the journals as well as uh, agenda itself. So that's a kind of a very big uh, kind of a challenge for. So when we see that in South Asian university, in the promotion committee meetings or you know in the selection committee we see that the candidates come out with these uh, challenges and they face that uh, how to publish in q1 q2 and most of them they are coming with saying that without big data and quantitative kind of analysis it's very difficult nowadays to publish 
in those journals. And in many cases, the South Asian scholars, they don't have that kind of the source of data set. So these are the challenges. And also, as you mentioned, I'm very happy that uh, we talked about the agenda itself, that uh, the broader agenda of developing countries, Global South is totally missing in the this journals. Uh, but I'm not sure that whether they will change it or not. You gave a good proposal. Uh, let's see that uh, how it goes. Uh, but also, um, I think South Asian scholars, they also need to, uh, and also universities, they need to uh, think about. One problem is that when we go for ranking, then uh, you know that this again come with this Q1, Q2, and the Scopus Index and all these things. Uh, but uh, also South Asian universities or even the developing countries universities need to think about whether they will set a different criteria for uh, this whole uh, recognition of publications. So, uh, much more impacts. We talk about nowadays lots of impact issue, but there are much more impacts by South Asian scholars without publishing in these top 10 journals while they're just publishing a book in a local language. But there is no means to evaluate and uh, uh, criteria in those things and uh, in, in India there are fascinating books in Bangladesh there are fascinating books in Pakistan people are writing in local language that is what is most important that's making real impact in policy the books that we are publishing for example uh, uh, we are sitting here in the international uh, journals or even uh, articles or even the books from uh, Routledge or Springer these are not been read by our readers. That's the first thing you have to understand that 120, 130 euro, euro or 150 US dollar price books are not been purchased in uh, South Asian universities. And uh, especially the students, they cannot get access. So people don't read those articles. Our policymakers, they don't get access to those articles. So when some are writing something in a very popular form, maybe they're, they're having a more uh, bigger impact. I'm taking a little bit uh, uh, longer time because I'm very excited by listening that uh, from some someone from Global North is saying this. Not only the Global South scholars' problems have been uh, identified by you. So thank you very much, Robert, for that. My last question and comments would be your uh, observation and about your last slide, that the supersized states future. That um, where sometimes we are um, assuming that uh, uh, even though you said that in the most of the cases, if you go back to history, the supersized emperors that they, they, they fall, and uh, even the supersized um, civilizations uh, they fall. So I my simple question is, what's wrong with that? If the supersized states fall, and we get a kind of a more smaller kind or a new kind of a structure, why are we are worried about that they will be falling? I don't see uh, in my just I, I, a very very open kind of a question that uh, why we are assuming that it is very necessary for the global order to have China as it is, as have India as it is, have USA as it is, and have European Union as it is. What's wrong with that, that if they are uh, getting fall and we see a new structure in the global order? Thank you. Well, th thank you. These are uh, wonderful questions. And let me just take them in reverse order. I, on the, I, I think the, you know, on the, on the second point, the second question first, uh, wh why should these super states continue to exist? Well, um, one argument would be that there are certain uh, kinds of policy problems that are more easily resolved you know, the, at, at scale. But my own view would be that if, if a super state can only be held together through the use of coercion or resort to authoritarian methods, then it shouldn't exist. Um, you know, the, uh, if, if governing at scale means uh, denigrating democracy and human rights, then, the, then it, there's a good case for disassembling the polity. Um, now, let me circle back on the first point, you know, the, uh, the, uh, just about the structure of the, the research enterprise, and, you know, others may have thoughts about this too. Um, I should say that, you know, I'm, so I'm Canadian um, and you know, I'm, I'm a relatively advantaged because I'm over, you know, in that small group of countries, but even in Canada, you know, the, the frustration is that the, the scholarly enterprise is dominated by um, American and British scholars, you know, it's, it, it's the research agenda, the things that have to discuss, get discussed, 
uh, banging my way into um, the <laughs> leading journals and so on was a tough exercise, even coming from Canada, which is a relatively easy case. Um, and, uh, and, and it's become worse because this emphasis on ranking, you know, top ranked journals and so on is a relatively new phenomenon. It's a phenomenon of the last 20 or 25 years. Everyone goes on about the top ranked journals. And it's, what it's doing is it's sort of locking in place the, the preeminence of these journals that are dominated by this set of countries. It's privileging them basically. And these, these enterprises are privileged, but they are not acknowledging that privilege also implies obligation to, to you know, ensure adequate representation. Um, and uh, you're right that some of these journals are, are emphasizing modes of research like big data that really complicates the problem of getting into the journals. But there are other journals that don't aren't using big data, but they still are not doing enough to bring in scholarship. And you know there are lots of folks in South Asia who are writing really interesting things about about governance, who could publish in these journals if the if the if the pathway was just made a little simpler. Um, and the people running these journals and associations ought to be doing more to to create that pathway. And I think the, the, the challenge I think for scholars in South Asia is the sort of same challenge that I've confronted throughout my career as being a non-American working in, in this sort of setting. It's, it's, you, it's sort of figuring out in part, when do you accommodate the realities and when do you push against the realities and say, you know, when do you sort of go along with the way that the the structure works, and when do you start pushing and saying no? This is not this is not the way the structure ought to work, and it is a sort of ongoing tactical question about when you accommodate and when you push. But I do think um, it's entirely reasonable for people in South Asia to say when you look at the way the enterprise is structured and basically say, well, you know, what are you doing to help us? participate in the global dialogue on public administration. Thank you uh, for the response, Dr. Roberts. Uh, Nandita, would you like to go next? Thank you. And uh, this presentation is really a very new area for me. I have never come across this kind of analysis of journal articles and everything, but I would rather say that only one word is applicable for people like us to publish. It's a nightmare. I must call it a nightmare. And how far journals are ready to accept articles for us, from us, from people from the South Asian region, I don't know. I have been working in the university for the last 10 years as a professional staff. I'm not an academic, but I have been seeing how struggle how much struggle these academics have in their lives to prove themselves that they are publishing in the top ranking journals, though I don't find any logic behind it. It's all because of this online Google click citation. You can count it now. You couldn't count it 30 years back or 25 years back. That's why you were ranking these journals. And are these journals ready to take articles from us? I have stopped thinking about it. I have done my PhD within the last eight hours. I tried and then I stopped. I told my supervisor, please don't ask me to write anything for publication. I am not with it. I'm very happy with what I'm doing. This is my feedback on journal article. But one thing as a scholar, as, as a think tank, you can do favor for us. Like development partners work in South Asian countries. If they, contribute to this kind of publication, encourage, uh, I worked in UNDP, if, if they encourage people like us to write, there are many thematic areas uh, that these kind of organizations are working, but these are not being published. It's only on website. Wonderful, nice stories on the website, success stories of NGOs, government, 
But if development partners really look into the, this, you will have increased number of publications from these developing countries or South Asian region, I am sure. If you could really advocate for the, this, I cannot because I don't, I don't think anyone will listen to what I say. This is one of my suggestions. My two questions in relation to your book that you are suggesting, it's amazing, but only for this, I don't see any re re reason for a country like India is the largest democracy in the world. It is still being considered as the largest democracy. So I don't think it will be a solution for a country like India just to shed off things, just to be very much democratic. Um, I mean, how can you think of not India as an India? I'm not from India. Please don't misunderstand. I'm not from India. Uh, and my question is, you said to avoid people as a political creed. Does it mean that you are going to change the definition of democracy? Uh, how come I avoid people in democracy in the name of a political creed? That's my first question. My second question is, you said, accept fragility. Who is accepting? Uh, the people, the citizens, or economically affluent countries, those who provide support to the developing countries? If you could please answer these two questions. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I'll just make, uh, so a couple of points here. Um, just on the, on the research side, you know, so I was an editor of a journal called Governance uh, for, co-editor for nine years. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, one of the things I said was, you know, so a common a common statement by journal editors is, well, you know, we get article submissions from the global south, but they never make it through the review process. Uh, they never survive the review process. Or, um, you know, we we ask we get these sort of conventional thirty page. You know, the standard is a thirty page, thirty five page research paper, and the argument is, well, you know, they these 35 page research papers don't survive the review process for one reason or another. And, and my question was, well, what is magical about a 35 page research paper? You know, why does, why does, how did we decide that that is the natural sort of unit of academic production? What would happen if we asked scholars um, in the global South to write a, a, uh, a 10 page a piece on some challenge of governance um, that would be more manageable and that would include the prospects of publication and you can say a lot of important things in 10 pages and this sort of gets back to a point i was making earlier on if the the rules of the game as they are presently constructed are impeding representation from important parts of the world then change the rules of the game um, they're not, they're not, you know, given to us by divine instruction. So um, that that's one option. The other thing too is just, if you're a journal editor, go out and look for contributors. Uh, journals are far too passive. They sort of sit there and wait for the contributions to come in. Um, another observation would be, as you've said, you know, very often you get. Uh, NGOs or development agencies um, doing studies of governance in the uh, global south, and they very often come up with very well developed, thoughtful findings on questions of administration and governance. But then the, you don't go the final step of converting that report into an article that gets put into a journal. Um, I noticed I did a lot of work on right to information in uh, India um, uh, between 2000 and 2010 or so. And I noticed, you know, the law went into effect in 2005. And then there were several studies of the implementation of the law in the next five years. And these studies were being done, but um, they weren't being reflected in the academic literature because no one was going sort of the final step of converting the report into a journal article. 
Um, I made a little effort to kind of capture that by doing a, I called it a book review, but it was essentially a review in which I sort of synopsized what all of these reports were saying. But a simple way of, of improving representation would be just to make sure that when these reports are done, that there is some pathway provided to getting it into the academic world. Um, just on the on the substantive bit about my conver conversations about super states. So uh, when I say recognize fragility is um, um, endemic to super states, I want to emphasize I'm not just talking about developing countries. You know, I would say that about the United States as well. Um, there was for much of American history up until the 1930s, the leadership group in the United States governed as with the idea that the United States was a fragile enterprise, that it could fall apart if it wasn't managed well. Leaders in the European Union govern with this sense of fragility, right? There's always this sense that if they misstep, things could fall apart. Um, and, um, and I think you could probably argue that Xi Jinping and his colleagues do that as well. You know, they always talk about stability maintenance and so on. And, and the argument I would make is that you have to have this sort of sense of fragility in mind because it, um, just to put it loosely, it keeps you on your toes. You are, you're not blindsided by crisis. You, um, you're not surprised by crisis. You're asking yourself, where is the next danger going to come from? That's the, the idea. I don't mean to suggest that we should accept poor governance. It's just that I mean that the style of governance would be one in, that, in which you're always attentive to threats. Where will the next pandemic come from? Where will the next financial crisis come from? Where will the next migration crisis come from? And so on. Um, the, and, and when I was thinking about you know, so the classic mode of state building uh, in the late 19th century and the 20th century was about building a so-called nation state, a state that had one people with one common history and one common culture, um, a certain kind of homogeneity or commonality to the population. Um, maybe that's plausible in a small state in a supersized state, I think that's a dangerous formula um, because uh, it, it, well, it, it jeopardizes minority rights, uh, whether it's uh, religious minorities or uh, regional minorities. Um, you know, in, in that you can't have a common culture in a supersized polities. You're going to have um, many cultures many histories, many peoples. That, that's sort of what I was getting at. So the, the idea, the question is basically how you uh, build in a, an acknowledgement of diversity into the, you know, um, the, the national idea. People sometimes talk about the idea of India or the idea of Europe or the idea of the United States. That's what I'm sort of getting at. How do you build a, a creed that justifies the enterprise but also accommodates diversity? I should say, on, you know, on the other hand, China, um, uh, look at what they're doing in Xinjiang and Tibet and uh, Hong Kong. Um, you know, that's, that's an attempt to have a certain degree of homogene homogeneity, cultural and political, which is not the way we want to go. Uh, my first question was how we can avoid people as political creed. Ah, well, um, the... Uh, I, I, I think um, we just f find a way of talking about politics that accommodates diversity. So um, I can't remember what other words I had on the, the slide, but you know, there is, um, you know, in, in the United States, for example, people are uh, always talk about the American public. What does the American public think? Uh, how did the American public vote? Uh, what are the American public's values? Uh, what kind of mandate did the president get from the American people? Um, and if you thought that the country was one people, one common 
population, maybe you could talk that way. But if you think that the country is deeply divided as the country is between the so-called red states and the blue states, uh, then you know it's not a question of what the public thinks. It's a question of what one public thinks and what the other public thinks. You know, they're, they're different publics. They're different people. You, do, you wouldn't expect there to be a popular mandate because um, that's assuming that it's one public. So it's a different way of thinking about the way you're, the population you're governing. Before ni- the 1930s, before the New Deal, um, people in the United States, when they talked about politics, would the normal way to describe American politics was um, the country is divided into sections. There's the North, there's the South, there's the Midwest, there's the West. The sections have different interests. Um, and uh, one historian said, you know, actually every section is kind of like a country in Europe. <laughs> and what goes on in politics is sort of negotiation. It's like diplomacy between the different sections. So it's a different mentality, a different way of thinking about the job of governing. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, any any other questions? All right. Uh, I would like to follow up on uh, several of these topics. Uh, I was just sitting quiet not to take over uh, the discussion as a moderator. <laughs> so, uh, but um, Nandita, you are right. And a nightmare is the word for most of the academicians uh, who are not working in the mainstream research agenda, or as um, Dr. Robert suggested, who are not uh, from the mainstream region who dominates the publication uh, world. Uh, myself, one of them, a South Asian uh, scholar focusing on South Asia, uh, and also um, n- not just South Asian, just uh, I, I focus on nonprofit management leadership. And I started doing my research almost 15, 20 years ago. It was just a very uh, new field, and people didn't even recognize nonprofits as separate from for profit at some point. So some of the business professors were like, what do you mean by nonprofit organization? How they, they don't exist. We don't understand. Uh, I, and I was shocked because I was doing my PhD in nonprofit organization management and leadership. So, and I took this professor's course who was in a business school, a very, very famous leadership um, professor. And he just discarded the entire uh, group of organization, the entire sector, saying that I don't believe there is anything nonprofit. You know, organizations are organizations. They make businesses are dominating and they will dominate. So and, and now we have a pretty large um, community of scholars focusing on nonprofit after 20 years almost. We, we have pretty grown field, but uh, it was a struggle. And publishing in... Um, top rank journal was a struggle, struggle in the beginning as well. So, uh, and, and imagine publishing with uh, an agenda of nonprofit in South Asia, in a small village somewhere in India. Um, it, 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 was, it was not easy. Um, so it, it's not just the South Asian scholars, but it's just the uh, area itself. And it could be any, any area. So this domination point is valid and a lot of uh, scholars are struggling. Uh, with that. Um, But also I was thinking about, and I have always been thinking about this because a lot of scholars from um, India that I interact, uh, we talk about this a lot, that there are are several um, angles we need to combat this issue. One being the systematic, that as a student, we need to, uh, as a student, uh, I mean, as an institution, we need to really train students to do research with a good quality as a basic first step so that they don't get lost when they become professionals, either think tanks or academicians or whatever, uh, wherever they are working. Uh, so that's, that's the first step. And then um, as, as um, Dr. Roberts mentioned that they should go one step further and access the um, information about journal publishing and send papers out. Don't just stop at the working paper series on UNDP website or working paper series on World Bank. Um, and, and believe it or not, one of the best research that I have come across is from those kind of working paper series or something that is published on some nonprofit's website. That was most insightful and useful that I would like to cite in my research. And I have done that, but 
uh, if I want to get published, I ha also have to, as, as Dr. Roberts mentioned, a balance of good journals, ranked journals, uh, working paper series, and all, all everything else comes under publication. And, um, and that's where I feel like, oh, this has such a big potential to really get published in one of the top journals, but uh, unfortunately it just stopped here. So uh, point very well taken. And I think this is, this is great presentation, Dr. Roberts. And I, I hope that this movement gets um, more active in South Asia and they have their own journals and their own um, you know, structure rules, as you say rule of the games that, that they can start playing around and, and then start competing at the national, international levels. Well, I should say too, you know, one of the other aspects of this is, um, um, you know, if you look at any of the top journals, actually most of the journals in the field, um, where do they actually get produced? Where do they actually get, um, you know, all the layout and design and so and all that, the actual production of the journals, where would you guess that actually happens? Anyone want to speculate? Yeah, most, most of the developed nation, the dominated list that you presented. <laughs> it's India. India. India and the Philippines are the two major centers for journal production. So all yeah, of those journals. From, from, yeah, for the back end part. Yes. I mean, production process part. Yes. The, the production process. Is it yes. Printing? Yes. Not, yes. not well, print? journals. Printing is sort of uh, going. Um, printing is sort of doesn't happen really much. I mean, some journals do printing, but printing is really becoming sort of obsolete. For example, governance, they essentially stopped printing the journal, but halfway through my term as editor, but all as what we call the back office, all the production stuff is now, at least for our journal, but well, for most of the journals is now done in India. And then Philippines is another um, major uh, center. So there is this peculiarity that we've got an industry that is highly profitable, that is, relies on production services in the global south, um, but does not actually represent the global south in the pages of the journals, um, which sort of just adds to the uh, unfairness of the whole regime, frankly. Absolutely, I, th I think all, all, even all the um, other, other publishing uh, houses have um, offices in India. And whenever I try to contact anybody for any book project or anything, I am always connected to uh, somebody in the India office. So uh, you're absolutely right. The whole process making is in um, India. And I, I think it is the uh, imbalance of economic, political um, factors that's always going to take over some of this stuff. Um, and you know, a, a simple thing that journals can do is just acknowledge the production chain. They can just right. uh, just be frank about, you know, we, we say this about the fashion industry and a whole bunch of other industries. Like, why don't you just acknowledge how the, your product actually gets made and who does the work? Acknowledge mm -hmm. the, the people doing the work. Why can't you, when you publish a journal article, acknowledge the actual individuals who actually put the, the article together? So that would be a simple idea uh, as well that I think would just kind of provoke a conversation about the the entire enterprise also mm -hmm. that and publishing their actual profits absolutely yeah yeah any anybody else would like to chime in any other questions comments uh good, afternoon, got a good evening good morning can i have uh, two three minutes please Sure, Mr. Sarkar, you can go ahead and then uh, Sarkar, you can uh, take over. My name is Abulia Sarkar. I'm um, the University of Sharjah, United Arab Emirates. Um, just uh, I want to pick up a few things and comment, and I hope uh, Professor Roberts can reflect on those. The first thing is that, well, I blame myself for not being able to enter the top journals or to publish in the top journals, J part or PAR, all these things. But what I want to emphasize that some of the journals, uh, for example, in the subcontinent, 
I mean, I would not say it's a journal, it's a magazine, for example, EPW, Economic and Political Weekly. I would read this magazine is one of the finest in the world. Okay. It, uh, maybe exaggerated because I have been following this EPW since 1980 when I was two, uh, second year undergraduate student. I was introduced this uh, magazine and I have been following since then until now. And I think if I, if I uh, sincerely honest enough, the best insights I, I have got about South Africa political economy is from that magazine. But those are not indexed in Scopus, you know, that is the biggest irony. Number one. Uh, number two, about uh, this quantitative analysis and publications, you know, all this. Uh, recently, one of my colleagues uh, here in, in the Department of Management, he has written an article which he has published in Research Policy, I think one of the top grades, you know, critical journal about all these um, discourses, methodology. And he has struggled to publish this uh, article where he has unfolded the mystery that particularly these quantitative articles that which are published in Journal of Management, Journal of Business Ethics, and also the J part, I mean, in the Business Administration Journal Top Grid, why they cannot be replicated? why there is a lack of authenticity of data, okay? Second, <laughs> okay. And third thing that, what is the significance of this Stanford top 2% uh, two scholar? I'm really ignorant of this because I have found a few colleagues of mine who are in the list and uh, that has made me not actually crazy and not. So just, I want to, if you can reflect a little bit on it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you. I, I actually, I'm not familiar with the Stanford top 2% scholars. I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm not one of them either. So uh, <laughs> you're, I'm sure you're in, you're in good company. The, um, uh, you know, EPW is a wonderful uh, journal and, um, it sort of goes to a uh, another point, uh, which I was saying earlier on is, you know, part of this story is the question of whether journals have created barriers that make it harder for people um, in the global south to publish in the in their journals. But the other part of the quest story is just whether the people running the journals and the conferences and the professional associations are doing enough to proactively go out and find people and content that is relevant. Um, because, you know, you've mentioned EPW, but there are the many fascinating books about governance in South Asia that are published every month. You know, uh, yeah, get them, get them, review, get them reviewed in the main, why aren't they reviewed in the main journals? Why don't book review editors make a point of finding those books and then finding reviewers? Um, why don't people at the conferences sort of go out and actually look for the people? You know, maybe the people writing the books haven't thought about the idea that they could contribute to a journal or a conference. So, so it's, um, it's a supply side and a demand side. I don't know how that would work in this story, but uh, issue. Um, and just to follow on this point, since this is a conference that is um, um, being done in collaboration with NASPA, uh, NASPA has an obligation here. NASPA is an organization that is, um, says it is, is self-defined, has taken on the mantle of being a, a global organization setting a global standard for public affairs education. And that implies that it has an obligation to think about what needs to be done to ensure that scholars in the global South can participate in the, in the conversation. So I think the question has got to be for NASPA, what is it doing to proactively think about 
how to help scholars in the, in the global south and schools of public, public affairs too, I should say. Maybe we'll go for one last question from uh, Ms. Sattar. Right. It's more than a question, actually. I'm really, um, uh, it's very interesting and very thoughtful um, conversation that has just happened. And I'm really um, sitting in Pakistan, listening to it. It's quite a good opportunity. And I'm, I was thinking about the work that Dr. Roberts was talking about, uh, about the empires. And I was just thinking that this sense of fragility, as you have also mentioned, you know, it sometimes comes from the uh, the source is actually considered to be the very citizen. So states like Pakistan, increasingly India, uh, more I'll say about this, where, you know, now they have become so skeptical of the citizens when you are trying to sort of point out that what is happening or uh, the things could be uh, done in a different way. We need to uh, take care of the human rights and other things. You are also seen as someone who is creating that sort of sense of fragility or, you know, going against the empire that way. So it's interesting. And actually, when we're talking about the empire, also, I, um, I'm i in Lahore. Um, two days ago, the air here was so oppressive because of the quality of the uh, environmental indicators that we have here. It's quite... Um, you know, difficult to become, uh, to, to so, sort of even breathe during the winters, right? The the challenges of the government that these uh, super states are going to uh, have, they are like many fold. Not that the European or Americans, they, don't, they didn't have it. I'm thinking about Sen's work where he said that, you know, there's a third world within the first world also. But, you know, here this scale is, it's, I think this sort of a state, at least I can very surely say this about Pakistan, that we are a um, sort of a country, which is a third world country, but we have this like first world sort of an environment where the elites are trying to sort of control the resources and everything. And they're the ones who are actually telling how to uh, protect the state or not to go against the empire, right? So I, I, I'm also thinking about it, okay, um, and, and then we are also talking about the scholarship that's being produced, right? So the most of the scholarship that's also emanating from here is also coming from the people, and I am also a part of that, you know, who belong to relatively privileged classes, English-speaking class, merely 3% of the population here is uh, uh, proficient in the language. So I'm just thinking about it, the things that come into the agenda, I mean, we are just like, uh, Robert is very kind enough to actually listen to all these things, they, uh, how this is, uh, uh, there is this like um, uh, inequality when we're talking about it that not does not give representation to the people from South. But my point is here that who are the people who are getting the representation from South? You know, they're the ones who are uh, somehow, I think, not very much rooted in the society also. And therefore, you also see the problems that we talk about even in academia. They somehow do not at times even relate, students are not even able to relate with that, right? So there are like so many thoughts related to it and I would really love us all to continue and continue to reflect on our own positions, you know, uh, within the third world, within the developing country, within these new, newly formed uh, super states that are going to be. So that's what I had to say. Thank you very much. This, this was a very useful and insightful session. Thank you, Sathar. Thank you. And I, I you know, so the uh, just quick thoughts on that. So the, you know, the, the governance challenges confronting, uh, well, the leaders of every country in the, in the coming century are going to be immense, but especially in the global south. Um, and the, the thing I worry about is that the tendency to centralize responsibility for managing all of these problems putting aside the whole question of democracy and human rights, we just tend to overload the center. You know, the, the basic question of whether a leadership group at the center of a very large polity has the capacity to intelligently dispose of all the issues that are put on its plate. Um, and then the general, the second question of whether it has the bureaucratic capacity to actually do anything competently in response to those problems. So overload, and then all of the pathologies of bureaucracy that kind of come with scale. So that's an argument for decentralization right there. Um, and then the second thing is that, as you say, I mean, part of the threat to fragility 
um, does come from the people themselves, that sort of natural activity of people. Nobody likes being governed, you know? <laughs> um, and the complication, as I was saying on, is that the population is, um, it's percolating, it's bubbling more than it used to <clears throat> because people are educated, they're wired, they're mobile. You know, they're, they've got the capacity to organize themselves. And so if you're at the top, it, it's tougher to govern an environment like that. Uh, excuse me for just a second. And the, one of the dangers is, one of the impulses is to say, well, we need, you know, if you're a leader, we need to get a handle on things. It's the sort of authoritarian impulse. We yeah. need to clamp down in order to preserve uh, stability. And, and that's the other challenge, I think. We're, you can see that happening in several large polities right now, and that's the other danger. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I think we are at the end of our time. So uh, I would like to thank Dr. Roberts for your insightful presentation and your willingness to share your insights. Always great to have you and listen to you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining this talk. Uh, it has been a pleasure. Uh, NASPA would like to thank everyone who has been uh, so supportive of, for this, of this conference. And um, th thanks all. We'll see you around. We still have the entire day to hang out and listen to excellent presentations. Of course, uh, we have all night here. <laughs> but... <laughs> I'm going to bed. <laughs> I know. I know. I, yeah, yeah. Most of us will do. But uh, Thanks everyone. And we already have our next speaker in house. So let's take a break for a minute and then we will uh, start our next talk. Thank you very thank, much. Thank you all. <laughs>